is to tell someone how they can know the Savior. It's a good thing. We continue tonight in our study of the armor of God. And it's been a couple weeks. Last week we had to cancel services because we didn't have a parking lot. We had an ice skating rink. And uh, I'm thankful that that's been taken care of and we can have church again. But um, just to remind ourselves a little bit of, of this series... I want us to review just a little bit. We're, I want us to, to remember, first of all, that we are in a spiritual battle. And you can turn to Ephesians 6. We'll read a couple of verses here. But as, as Christians, and I'm, I'm preaching to saved people tonight, um, there'll, there'll be some, I'll say some things about salvation itself. And if you don't know the Lord, you ought to want to. You ought to want to know Him and to uh, come into a personal relationship with Him. Salvation is not by works. It's not by doing just what your church says and jumping through the hoops and saying things and doing all this and you'll get to heaven by earning it. That's not how salvation comes. It comes through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, in the, in the blood that He shed on the cross, and repentance of your sins. And so if you've done that, if you've experienced that and you've come into a saving knowledge of Christ, you are a Christian, you're a saved child of God, and because of that, you are in a spiritual battle. You are not the devil's friend anymore, you're not his child, spiritual child, you are God's child, and you are the devil's enemy. And that's what Ephesians 6 is talking about. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, it says, Finally, my brethren... Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to, to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. And if you're a child of God, again, the devil is attacking you. He's devising tricks to defeat you and to trip you up and to discourage you and to get you to quit. And this battle that we're in is not of our own doing. We didn't cause this spiritual battle. It's not our choice. I, I think probably all of us, if we were just going by comfort alone, all of us would say if getting out of the spiritual battle is an option, I would like to do that because it's not comfortable being in the spiritual battle. It's not our choice. This spiritual battle began long before we, will, we were born and it will continue long after we leave this earth. It may be intimidating for us to meditate on the intensity of the raging battle. And we read, I remember the, Elisha and talking to his servant, and there was an enemy army surrounding Samaria, and Elisha prayed for God to open the servant's eyes, and he saw chariots of fire, the Lord's forces. But if we could see the Lord's spiritual forces and see the devil's spiritual forces and see the battle that's raging, it might be, it might be intimidating to us. It might be intimidating to think about it. But it should cheer us to remember that the saint is sheltered by God and that the Lord wants us to fight in his army. He wants us to participate. He doesn't need us in order to win, but he desires that we fight this battle with him. It's a great privilege to serve under the captain of our salvation. Turn to Hebrews chapter 2. This was an exciting passage of scripture to me. I, I remember reading it before, but I read it again recently, and it excited me at the, with the truths that we find in it. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9, says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Jesus, the Son of God, made like us to die so that we wouldn't have to. Verse 10, for it became him, or, or, or uh, fitted him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect, through sufferings. We're going to come back to that. That's an amazing statement. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. 
for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And that's referencing a passage in Psalm, Psalms. But verse 9, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. End of verse 10 is where I was going. To make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Christ is the captain of our salvation. He's the, he's the Savior. And it was important for him to come and suffer because it says he was made perfect through sufferings. I don't understand that. Perfect means complete. It doesn't mean that Jesus was flawed before he came to this earth. He's always been sinless and holy and, and flawless, perfect in that way. But to make Christ complete through sufferings is an amazing statement. And it makes me say, then how can I complain when I suffer? How can I gripe and bellyache and act like I don't deserve whatever it is when the captain of my salvation was made perfect through sufferings? But then it goes on, for both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified. Christ sanctifies, God sanctifies, we are sanctified. We are all of one, for which cause he, Christ, is not ashamed to call them brethren. You and I, we should know who we are. We should know our flesh. We should know our sin. We should know our sinful tendencies. You read the news and you hear all kinds of uh, terrible headlines about, about wicked things that are done. Crimes against individuals, human trafficking, all kinds of violence. And we say, wow, some people are really bad. But if you know who you are, you understand that you have the same ability to sin as anyone else does, and so do I. We all have that same ability. And yet, when we are sanctified, when we are saved, the Lord is not ashamed to call us brethren. It's an amazing statement, and we ought to praise the Lord. But we are in a spiritual battle, and it is this spiritual battle that the devil is fighting to keep more people from being saved, to rob glory from God, and to just disrupt everything that God wants to do. And so if you're saved, you're part of God's army, and the devil is attacking you. So not only are we in a spiritual battle, but we are targets in the spiritual battle. It's one thing, maybe... Um, if, if you've ever been in combat, or I, I imagine combat, and, and maybe you're hidden, maybe you're in a bomb shelter, maybe the battle is going on around you, but nobody's firing at you, that's not the case in this spiritual battle. 1 Peter 5.8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. He's looking for people, maybe like you, people whom he may devour. And if that's you, he's going to come try to devour you. 2 Corinthians 2.11 says, Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. In Ephesians 6, we read, read about the wiles of the devil, his snares, his traps, his tricks that he's trying to come up with to trip you up and to defeat you and to destroy you. Luke 22, 31, Christ is speaking to Peter and he says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. And the devil had seen Peter the apostle and he said, I want him. I want to destroy him. I want to defeat him. I want to, to, to destroy God's work in his life. And the devil wants to do that for you if you're saved. If you're lost tonight, the devil wants to keep you that way. He wants to distract you from the truth. He wants to lead you astray. He wants you to believe a lie. He wants you to do anything but come to God in salvation. And if you're saved, you're saved forever. And you cannot be unsaved, cannot be lost after that. And so the devil can't destroy your soul, but he wants to destroy your body. He wants to destroy your testimony. He wants to destroy your faith in God. He wants to destroy your effectiveness for God and your, your usability, your service for God. He wants to destroy all these things. We are targets in this spiritual battle. Another thing that we've talked about in this series is that we may stand in the spiritual battle. We don't have to be defeated. We don't have to fall. We may stand. We already read in Ephesians 6, verses 10 and 11, it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. It's possible. If we're commanded to be strong in the Lord, we know it's possible. And in the power of his might, put on the whole armor of God. Again, it's commanded. It's possible that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. It is the armor of God. 
of God, not of us, of God, that we may be strong in him. And when we wear his armor, we will stand. When we put down the armor, we will fall. We didn't ask for the fight, and we are targets in the fight. But praise the Lord that we may stand and be victorious in the fight. At least, if I can't escape it, if, if I can't avoid it, at least I can win it by God's power. And that's a great thing. I, I remember reading, I think it was a novel even, a, not even a historical uh, non-fiction kind of book, but it was talking about battle, and this king who was about to go into battle said something to the effect of, if you don't go out into the, onto the battlefield and you fight, if you don't do that, you won't win any glory. There's no glory to be won except on the battlefield. Let's not run from the battle, let's go out and fight because we can win glory that way. And I think that's a good way of looking at the spiritual battle. If I try to hide in my basement and, and just stay out of the fight and, and stay out of conflict, spiritually speaking, I'm not going to see God use me. I'm not going to see souls come to Christ because the Lord used my witness. I may as well get out there. I can't, I can't escape the battle. I can't be, uh, keep myself from being a target in the battle. I may as well get out there and labor for Christ and follow the Lord's leading and witness to people and see God work. Of course, I'm not talking about a physical fight. We're not talking about conflict physically with people and fighting with people. We're, we're fighting the devil and we act like Christ, we live like Christ, we witness for Christ, and God will use us. We can be victorious. And I've kind of talked about this being an offensive posture that we might have. When we talk about standing and putting on the armor, I tend to think of, 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 of a defensive posture. Just, just don't lose kind of a thing, and that's not the right attitude. We can have an offensive mindset, and that is, I'm going to go look for somebody to witness to. I'm going to go look for something to do for the Lord. I'm going to go out and fight, spiritually speaking. I'm going to pray. I'm going to ask God to use me. I'm going to charge the gates of hell, so to speak, asking God to use me and to bring lost souls to Christ. We don't need to be afraid of the devil because he's already lost. He's already lost. The end chapter has already been written. The Lord has already won the battle. Christ has risen from the dead. He's a living Savior, and the devil is a beaten foe. He's already defeated, and when we wear God's armor, we may attack him and his kingdom using the word of God and watch the Holy Spirit snatch souls away from the devil's clutches and adopt them into God's family. It's a wonderful way to live, but it's not an easy way to live. It's a spiritual battle. Of course, we've been talking about how the armor of God can be demonstrated in our thought life. Right living begins with right thinking. And if you don't think right, you are well on your way to being defeated. You might know how to act, but if you're not thinking right, you're just not going to act the right way very long. A godly life begins with a godly thought life. And so let's put on the armor of God in our minds first and watch as it permeates the rest of our life. It begins in our mind, in our thoughts. Two messages ago in this series, we looked at the disciplined mind, which is represented by the belt of truth. In Ephesians 6.14, it says, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. It's talking about a belt, and they would, they would strap out, soldiers would, would, would tighten this belt, and they would gather up their, their tunic, the longer folds of their outer garment, and they would tuck it into this belt, and it would allow their legs greater movement. It would, it would keep keep their armor tight, it would keep their weapons tight, whatever they were hanging on their belt. This belt of truth was, this belt that they were wearing as soldiers was very important. It allowed them to be active and allowed them to carry weapons into battle. And spiritually, we need a belt and its truth that, that binds us and keeps us structured, keeps us uh, mobile, so to speak, keeps our thoughts where, where they ought to be, helps us to know what is right, helps us to know what is true. Truth does this in our life. It gives our life structure, security, and consistency. And we see ultimately that the Bible is truth, but Christ is truth. The Word of God is truth, and Christ is the living Word. And so we see this commonality between Christ and the Word of God, the Scriptures. By reading and obeying Scripture, we learn the truth that we need in order to fight the spiritual battle. Last time, we considered the pure mind represented by the breastplate of righteousness. 
As, as we mentioned with the belt of truth, that represents a disciplined mind, thinking about the kinds of things that we should think about, and knowing what we should think because truth says what we should think. Last time we looked at the breastplate of righteousness, representing the pure mind. And this righteousness comes to us first when we are saved. We take on the righteousness of Christ through salvation. We're forgiven. We are given his righteousness. He takes our, our wickedness. But then we also have to live righteously. We have to put on this breastplate every day. We have to follow the commands that God's given us. We have to not only be positionally righteous in Christ as children of God, but we have to live that way. We have to have a pure mind, a mind that thinks only the things that God wants us to think. And when we deviate from that, as we do, because we're not sinless, we need to immediately run to God and repent so that he can cleanse us and begin our mind thinking on the right thing again. This is what living a pure mind is all about. And if we don't have a pure mind, we're not going to stand. This world is full of garbage. This world is full of perversion. And if you spend much time, even in, I'll just call it pop culture, where it's, it's just the, the daily happenings of the world, it's not godly. It's not going to encourage you in godliness. And it doesn't have to be inherently wicked to have a negative effect on you. Just the daily drama and what so-and-so said and, and what scandal is happening and what news, none of that is encouraging us and drawing us nearer to God. And the more you spend time thinking about that, the more you're going to be susceptible to the devil's attacks. We need to have a pure mind thinking on what is true, as Philippians 4.8 tells us. We need to think righteously in purity. And when we do that, we're protected from countless sins and false ways of thinking. This is what, means, what it means to have a pure mind. Tonight, we're going to talk about Ephesians 6, 15, which says, And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. This piece of armor has been called the gospel shoes. Feet shod with the preparation of the gospel in, of peace. And I've entitled the message tonight, The Sanctified. Mind. We've looked at the disciplined mind, the pure mind, and tonight we're going to look at the sanctified mind. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would help us to have sanctified minds. Help us to think right. And we can be specific on what we mean by that. How do we think right? What does that even look like? How do we know if we're doing it? And we ought to have a disciplined mind, thinking only about the, the truths of God's word. We ought to have a pure mind by, by weeding out the impure and wicked thoughts that come in. Lord, we ought to have a sanctified mind given over to do things for God because he has redeemed us, he has saved us, he's purchased us. We are not our own, we're bought with a price. And I pray that you would help us to think and to have a sanctified mind for your honor and glory, not for our own plans, not for our own uh, ambitions, but for your glory, for your praise. Help us to learn from the scriptures tonight in Jesus' name, amen. Having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I mentioned the sanctified mind. The word sanctified means made holy, consecrated, set apart for sacred services. And I've used this example before. If you have a set of fine china, you don't pull it out to, to use just for everyday uh, meals. You don't pull it out to, you know, set... set dirty and, and filthy things on. You use it for very special occasions for that time when, when maybe when your best company comes over, whatever that means. It's a very special thing. It's used only for that. It's, sanct it's sanctified. It's consecrated. And when we think about the King of Kings, God, and who he is, all that he deserves, one day we're going to see him in his glory. And if we could just catch a glimpse of, of his glory and, and how high and lifted up he is, and the fact that he wants our minds to think on him and to think thoughts that he prescribes for us, I think we'd be a lot more concerned about having sanctified minds, set apart, made holy, consecrated for the Lord. How does the gospel sanctify our minds? Why would I, why would I choose this word to describe the, the, the thought life represented in this verse? Well, the word gospel, of course, generically means a, a, a good or joyful message. Just 
anything could be a gospel message in that sense. It's a joyful message. That's a generic definition. But in Scripture, that word is not used generically. I was, I was very interested to see this and, and reassured. I, I expected to find this, but it was interesting still to study it out. Every time we find the word gospel in the New Testament, it means the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the good news, the joyful message. And what is that good news? Well, it is the gospel of salvation. Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It is the power of God that brings a person to salvation. That is what the gospel of Christ is. Mark 1.15 in order to be saved. Jesus is preaching in Mark 1.15, and he says, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye, and believe the gospel. If you're going to be saved, if, if the power of God unto salvation in the gospel is going to apply to your life, you need to believe the gospel. And I've had folks tell me, uh, I'll, I'll be talking to strangers, meeting them on the street, and talking about spiritual things, and they'll tell me, oh yes, I believe the gospel. Yes, that, that's how a person is saved. I believe the gospel. And then I often t ask them, well, can you tell me what the gospel is? And most of them cannot. They can't tell me what the gospel is. Well, it's the good news. Well, the good, good news about what? And may I say to you, if you don't know what the gospel is, even what I've just said, okay, the, the power of God and salvation, you have to believe the gospel, but, but what is the gospel? What is this message? If you can't tell me what that is, then you most likely have not believed it for salvation. Because believing it is a conscious choice. It's an intentional choice. And you can't intentionally believe something that you can't define, something that you don't know. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians, and we'll see what the Bible says is the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15. The preparation of the gospel of peace. Well, this gospel is the gospel of salvation. 1 Corinthians 15 Paul is kind of coming back to a topic that he mentioned in the very first chapter of 1 Corinthians. He says in 1 Corinthians 1.17, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. In chapter 15, verse 1, he says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. This is it, where, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Okay, Paul, we're interested. What is this gospel? Verse 3, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Christ died just like the scriptures said he would die. He died for our sins, just like God planned. He was buried, he was truly dead, and they buried him, and he rose from the dead. He rose from the grave, he's a living savior. That is the gospel. That is what we must believe in order to be saved. You cannot go to heaven without believing that Christ died for your sins. Some people believe that they can work their own way to heaven. They don't need Christ to die for their sins. They can take care of it themselves. And if you're trusting in that, you won't get to heaven. And I would ask you, when did you believe the gospel and were saved? When were you born again? If you're going to have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, as Ephesians 6.15 says, you must first possess the gospel of salvation in your own heart. Putting on this piece of armor isn't possible if you're not saved. You must know Christ as Savior. If you have been saved, you have been sanctified or set apart unto God for His use. You've been redeemed. You've been purchased. That's what the word redeemed means. You've been bought with a price. You are not your own. You belong to your Savior. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 6.10, Nor thieves, nor covetous, talking about these uh, these kinds of sinners, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Christ came and paid the price of his life to purchase sinners. 
to make them saved, to pardon them and forgive them and wash their sins away. And if you're saved, you've been purchased. Your soul is sanctified. He purchased, to, he purchased you to use you, not for you to decide what you want to do and to pursue your own plans in this life. He purchased you to be glorified in you and to use you for his plans and so we are sanctified by him, but we need to sanctify ourselves and, and submit to that. We need to use our minds in a sanctified way. Our, our thought life needs to be a sanctified life set apart for only the master's use. When we use our thoughts to think doubting thoughts, to think fearful or angry or proud thoughts, our thought life is not sanctified for the Lord's use. It's sanctified for our sinful flesh, or the devil's use. When we use our thoughts to think lustful and lewd thoughts, we're not being sanctified in our thought life. We need to be set apart for only the master's use. But of course, Ephesians 6.15 says, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I noticed in the New Testament, the gospel is also called the gospel of the kingdom. It's called the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of the grace of God, the gospel of God, the gospel of his son, the gospel of the uncircumcision, the gospel of your salvation, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is also called the glorious gospel of the blessed God. And when you meditate on all that salvation brings to you, it's a blessing to hear these different descriptions of it. There are many wonderful truths on which we could meditate. But the gospel of peace is another way to talk about it and describe it. And, and why does he talk about that here? Why does he mention the gospel of peace? How is it the gospel of peace? Well, it's the gospel of peace because the gospel offers peace with God. Romans chapter 5 verse 1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And if you're lost tonight, you don't have peace with God. You've, you have turmoil in your soul. If you remember what it was like to be lost, maybe you, were, maybe you were saved as an adult and you remember very well what it was like to be lost and to, 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 to have that turmoil, to know, you remember what it was like to not have peace with God. It is a wonderful blessing knowing that we have peace with God the angels to the shepherds on the night Christ was born. They said, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. There's no true peace unless we have peace with God. We talk about world peace, but we might, we might be able to avoid a physical war, but there's no real peace apart from God. But it is the gospel of peace. The gospel offers peace with God. And, and we think about peace being horizontal, peace with each other. And we, we, we don't like conflict. I don't like conflict. I like peace. I like having peace. But I can have peace with you and still not have any peace in my life if I don't have peace with God. If I am at odds with God, if God is, is convicting me and I'm resisting him, I'm fighting him, it doesn't matter what kind of human peace I have. I am not at rest. I am not at peace. And the gospel offers peace with God. The, cost, the gospel brings, brings peace into the soul. I may have peace with God. We can also have turmoil because of our own conscience. God isn't even necessarily uh, fighting us or, you know, uh, striving with us at the moment, but our own conscience is convicted. We don't have peace in our own heart. And the gospel brings peace in the soul. When we know Christ... We may rest in Christ and have inner peace, no matter the storm around us. We talk about stress and how, when we usually use that word, we're talking about turmoil, inner turmoil. And, and we can have peace, even though everything around us is not peaceful. We can have peace in the soul. Jesus, in John chapter 14, talks about the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Think about that. Does that seem impossible? Let not your heart be troubled. Don't, don't let it be troubled. Don't let your heart be afraid. 
There are a lot of reasons that people are troubled today. A lot of reasons why people are afraid in this world. But we don't have to live that way. We don't have to be that way. We can have peace. Peace in our soul. Peace with God. It is the gospel of peace. It is a joyful message of peace. And we need to have our feet shod with it. The preparation of the gospel of peace. And as you go about your daily life, if you're saved and you go about your daily life, you, you wake up in the morning, you read your Bible, you get ready for the day, you go to work, do you have that peace? Do other people notice that peace? Or do they see turmoil and, 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 and chaos in your soul? Do they see that you're on edge and, and you know, your mood is just kind of unpredictable and they never know what they're going to get? They say hi to you and they don't know if they're going to get a smile or a grimace or a, a, a sharp retort. Do you have peace in your soul? You might be able to keep your mouth shut and not, not say the wrong thing, but you're not at peace. You've got, you've got all this turmoil, all this tension. We ought to use our minds in a sanctified way. Refuse to think faithless and fearing thoughts. Instead, use our sanctified minds to think thoughts that praise and glorify the Lord. We ought to have peace in our soul. And it is true. Sometimes life brings along circumstances that make it really hard to have peace in your soul. It's really hard. But it doesn't mean we can't doesn't mean that we should be without peace. doesn't mean that it's excusable. The gospel of peace is what we, what we need to bring peace. We can have peace with God. We can have peace in the soul. And these things, when we have peace with God, and when we have peace in our soul, those things usually bring peace with others. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. And if you're saved tonight, you ought to be able to see this in your own life. When you, are having, when you are right with God and you're not harboring sin, you're not fighting Him about something, you are surrendered, you are obedient, you are walking with Him, you're doing what He wants you to do, you have peace with God and fellowship with God, and you have peace in your soul, you're not struggling over, over guilt, uh, wrongful guilt. Sometimes we can struggle with guilt and there's no spiritual reason why we should. We've, we've confessed our sins, we're right with God, but we're, we're, we're thinking wrong about something. We're, we're struggling if, really with sinful thoughts of guilt. But we have peace in our soul, we have peace with God, and in those times I think you'll notice that you, it's easier for you to have peace with others. That usually takes two sides, and so uh, it takes two, two parties there, but it's a lot easier for us to be at peace with others when we have peace with God and in our soul. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26 says, Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. You don't have to sin even when you're angry. Neither give place to the devil. Don't give him any space. Let him that stole steal no more. No more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. It's a lot easier to talk that way when you have peace in your heart. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger, and clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. When we are speaking angrily with bitterness, with clamor, it's often because we feel something is wrong, and I have to fix it. They did something wrong, and I have to correct them. They wronged me, and I have to make sure they know about it. But when we have peace with God, peace in our soul, it's a lot easier to be at peace with others. And if they do something wrong, hey, I, I can still live in peace. I don't have to get upset about that. I don't have to be offended about that. It's a lot easier to be at peace with others. The gospel of peace. 1 Peter 1.22 says, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren... See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. 
1 John 3 talks about if we are saved, we love God. And if we love God and we're saved, we love the brethren. It's a natural thing to do. And when the brethren love each other and they love God and they're at peace in their soul, it's a lot easier to be at peace with each other. And that is the, the definition of a unified people, a unified group. We're, we're in love with God. We're at peace in our soul. And we love the brethren. It brings peace. Romans 12, 18, Paul is writing to saved people, but he's, talk, he's including the lost in his statement. He says, If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. And sometimes there are men who make peace impossible. And if people attack you physically, for instance, um, sometimes we need to defend ourselves. And so we can't live automatically live peaceably with all men. If some people are just refuse to live peaceably, we, we need to defend ourselves that there are times to do that. But especially if we're just talking about words or attitudes, it's amazing how much easier it is to be at peace with others when we are at peace with God and we have peace in our soul. The gospel of peace, having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. This is the effect that the gospel has in our life. It is the gospel of peace. And it ought to make us at peace with God and with each other. But this word preparation, we move through the message tonight. We're talking about the preparation of the gospel of peace. Preparation, of course, means to, to get ready for something ahead of time, to be prepared. It's intended to prevent evil or secure good. The preparation of the gospel of peace may be seen as the gospel preparing the saint for service. Preparation in the saint. The gospel prepares us to help others. The gospel changes us to be a blessing to others. When the gospel changes you and get, God gives you a new nature, you are now prepared to help other people. And every day you get up and you've got to deal with your lost, your, your, um, your sinful nature. You've got to deal with your, your human tendencies, the tendency to be selfish, the tendency to, to think about all these other things in life other than thinking about what God wants us to think about. We need to be prepared to, to, to withstand the attacks of the devil. We need to wear these, the, these shoes of the gospel of peace. We need to be prepared, have preparation in us. And I would ask us, how much, how much do you, as a, as a child of God, how much do you think about the gospel and its effect in your life? It's not just something that, that I believed in once to be saved. And yeah, it's important. People who haven't believed in it yet, they need to hear this. But on, an, on a daily basis, how often do you think about the gospel? The gospel of peace. The change that it's brought to your life. The way that we ought to be living it out and acting it out. Live, our, our life ought to be changed as a result of the effect that the gospel has had on us. It should be a constant presence in our life, constantly applicable, constantly relevant, should be changing us every day. Listen to what Paul said to the Philippians in Philippians 1.27. He says, only let your conversation, that's your lifestyle, conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. He didn't say as it becometh Christ. He says the gospel of Christ. The, our, our, our pattern for living is, is found in the gospel. And of course, the, the example of Christ is what we ought to be following as well, but, but that's encapsulated in the gospel. He says that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand in one spirit, stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Let your conversation, your lifestyle, your, your, the pattern of your life, every day, let it be something that fits the gospel of Christ. Every day. It doesn't happen by accident. We ought to think about it. Paul exhorted Timothy to stand fast in the faith, to commit the things that he has learned to others. To, let me just turn there, 2 Timothy chapter 2. He says, Be strong in the grace 
that is in Christ Jesus. Verse 3, thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Verse 4, no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of, his, of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully. Don't forget who's purchased you. Don't forget why you were purchased. And the gospel reminds us of this. Every time you, you, you are reminded of your sinfulness, it should remember what you've been saved from. Every time you remember your Savior, it should remember who saved you. And that should keep us motivated and keep us uh, buoyed up in our, our daily efforts to please the Lord and live sanctified. It should be preparing preparation in us, the, the gospel of peace, the preparation of the gospel of peace. It should also be preparation by the saint. We should prepare each day to live each day and prepare ourselves using the gospel of peace. And why is this necessary? We could, we could think, as you have your morning devotions, the gospel is what I'm going to be living today, and the gospel is what I need to be ready to be speaking today. We need to do that because we have opportunities to witness. We're always interacting with sinners who have an eternal soul, and these sinners either need a savior or they need to live like him. They either have him as their savior and they need to live like him, or they don't have him as their savior and they need him. And so no matter who you come in contact with, the gospel is going to be applicable for them. It's going to be applicable for you. We need to prepare ourselves with, with this message and be ready to speak it. The gospel is 100% relevant to all of us. We need to see the harvest not just the obstacles in bringing in the harvest. In John chapter 4, Jesus told his disciples, lift up your eyes and look on the fields. Look, there are people out there that need the Lord, people everywhere that need a Savior. We need to see the harvest. Sometimes we're just annoyed with people. Sometimes we just, we just focus on the hard-heartedness of people. Nobody wants to hear it. Whenever I try to witness, they always shut me down, and we, we look at the obstacles to the harvest. But we need to see the harvest. You might go to work and your boss is not in a very good mood. Maybe, you're, maybe your spouse is struggling with something. Maybe, maybe your car is in the shop, it's broken down, or your health is shaky. shaky. It's, it's, it's not doing real well. Rather than fixate on some of these temporal things, we can prepare our hearts to dwell on the gospel and share the gospel. It's hard to be discouraged when we are rejoicing in the work of God in souls. It's hard to be discouraged when you just had an opportunity to give the gospel to somebody and you're praying for that coworker, you're praying for that neighbor, that loved one. It's hard to be discouraged when you see God working in others. We're going to have unexpected opportunities to witness. And if we're not prepared, we won't be able to, to witness like we should. Well, I, I just thought this would be an easy day, a, a me kind of day, a take it easy kind of day. I didn't prepare to, to speak the gospel, and I had an opportunity, and I dropped it. We're going to have unexpected opportunities. We need to prepare ourselves each day that way. Put on the armor. We need to be ready. What might God use us to do if we prepared ourselves each day by saturating our minds with the truth of the gospel and refreshing our thinking to be more focused on the lost people all around us. How many more people might God touch through us if we were prepared every day? Well, there's only one way to find out. First, Tim, First Peter 3.15 says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Be ready always. If you've believed on the gospel, you've been saved, the gospel of peace is part of your life forever, for eternity. And you ought to be willing and, and ready to speak of it to others. Be prepared. Of course, this armor says your feet shod. And I think it's an interesting picture these, this gospel of peace is compared, is, is, is illustrated with the use of shoes. Of course, shoes are important. If you've ever, I, I do not go barefoot. And so if I go outside and I'm walking around on the gravel, I am walking pretty strange looking because it hurts. 
My feet are, are my, the soles of my feet are tender. They're not used to that sort of thing. And if you've ever walked on rocks, sharp, sharp things, or a Lego, maybe in the living room, um, you, you, you're thinking about your feet. You're not thinking about where you're going. You're thinking about the pain that you're experiencing. Soldiers fight better when they have good footwear. And a Christian soldier is no different. Usually when we have our shoes off, it means we're, we're taking it easy. We're not doing much. Let's put our shoes on. Let's, let's get busy. Let's do something for the Lord. Let's, let's put, our, put our, our, our armor on. Let's, let's have our feet shod. Good shoes help us walk through dirty places, rough places, hot and cold places. Shoes can help us move without fear or thought of our feet. We can just focus on the job at hand. The gospel helps us do this, helps us to be ready to go to work and to just move forward. Shoes are related to mobility and transportation. And Christ told us to go in Matthew 28, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. The gospel is associated with movement, with going, with transportation, with travel, with activity. We need to have our hearts prepared. We need to have our minds saturated with the gospel. We need to have our life ordered by the gospel, have our life in conformity with the gospel, live the gospel every day, and we need to be ready to go. And when we're prepared with the gospel of peace, this is a, it's really a wonderful gift. We, we're, we're surrounded by people in turmoil. We're surrounded by people in fear and, and health scares and, and, and national security issues and, and regulations, all these things keep, keep people in a state of fear, and we have the gospel of peace. We ought to be willing to go. Be ready. Let's get our shoes on. Let's get ready to go. Let's be prepared to go out and seek the lost. And when we're focused that way, we spend less time wallowing in self-pity, fear, despair, anger, whatever it is. Let's put on these gospel shoes every day. When we're busy serving the Lord, we're a lot less likely to be tempted to pursue after the devil's traps, the devil's attractions. We're busy, we're moving. We're on a mission. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20 say, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify, your, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. We think about the sanctified mind, and we have to think right. Sometimes we can get caught up in this trap of, of avoiding the wrong thoughts. And it's good to put off wrong thinking. But it's better, instead of just worrying about avoiding wrong thoughts, let's focus on right thoughts. Let's just saturate our minds with right thoughts. And the more that we pursue right thinking, the less we're going to struggle with wrong thinking. We're, we're too busy to worry with that. We're going to focus on, I'm too busy doing right things here. Let's not mess around with the wrong things, to think the wrong things. I'm too busy, this ought to be true of us, I'm too busy asking God, who can I witness to next? Who around me might, might be willing to talk to me? Who can I give a track to? Who can I talk about the gospel of peace to? I want to go somewhere. I want to find somebody that's seeking. I want to ask God to give me somebody that I can witness to. I'm prepared. I'm ready to go. I'm moving. The sanctified mind. I'm not going not gonna to spend time thinking about the what-ifs or the, the if-onlys, what I would change, what God's doing wrong. I'm going to be sanctified. I'm going to use my mind to think the thoughts that glorify Him, the thoughts that, that bring glory to Him, that, that help me serve Him. The gospel of peace can be our attire, our shoes. It can be our motivation. I am motivated because I have been saved. I have had the gospel of peace brought to my life, and it can be our message. It's what I have to, to tell. We have a story to tell, as we sang earlier. When we are consumed with God's mission to us, go ye therefore. When that just consumes us, it, 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 uh, it, it's our obsession in a good way. We will have a sanctified mind, a set-apart mind. I live to, to please the Lord. May that be our heart's desire. 
And if that's what we are, if that's who we are, I live to please God, to walk with God. I, I look forward to my prayer time. I look forward to my Bible time. I look forward to an opportunity to, to witness to a lost person, to share with them the love of Christ. I can't wait for another one of those. Lord, give me another chance. When we live that way, we will have a sanctified mind. And we will think right. And we will be living right. May the Lord help our feet to be shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for these challenging thoughts. Help us to be faithful in these things. It's easy to be distracted with the, the affairs of life. There are so many challenges that come our way, so many things that clamor for our attention, so many, so many things that we have to work on, and you know that, Lord but you'll give us the strength to do those things. Help our priorities, help our heart, help our love to be first and foremost for you and for your objectives. Help us to be given over to serving you and you'll take care of everything else. Help us to be prepared each day as we go through our daily life. Help us to be ready, overflowing with the gospel of peace. I pray that it would help us to be moving, to be going, to be seeking, and I pray that you would be glorified in it all. Help us to think in a sanctified way. Help our minds to be set apart for only the right kind of thoughts, to be off limits to wicked thoughts. Help us to be conscious and to be aware of our thinking, to be tracking our thoughts and to reject wrong thoughts. I pray that you would help us to have a disciplined mind, a pure mind, and a sanctified mind. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Thank you for your attention tonight. Hope you have a good second half of the week. We're going to be back here on Sunday at 9.45 in the morning for services and 11 as well and 6 p.m. are our three Sunday services. We hope to see you then. Until then, we'll see you later. Have a good week. You're dismissed. Thank you.